Chapter 12 Abby never made it to Kendra. As they began, 23 Raggedy Anna on the shelf, for the second time, Abby's tree collided with the remains of an old fishing pier. The wooden pier, unused for a dozen years, jutted several hundred feet out from shore. Buoys warned boats to stay away. The earthquake caused the pier to shift and sink so that it lay just below the surface of the river. Abby's tree floated between two buoys and hit the top of the last post on the pier. The collision jarred Abby and sent her tree spinning sideways away from Jonathan's. She dropped the leash and clutched her tree. My boat hit something, she cried. Hang on, Jonathan yelled. Put both arms around Charlotte and hang on. Remember, Charlotte is the um, tree that she's holding on to. Jonathan put his right hand in the water and paddled hard, trying to turn his tree toward Abby. The current was too strong. Even though the tree turned slightly, it continued to float rapidly forward. Abby seemed to have stopped moving. Stay with me, Abby called. Hold my hand. I can't, but you can still hear me. We'll be able to sing even better if we each hold tight to our own tree. To prove it, Jonathan started singing again. 23 raggedy ends on the shelf, 23 raggedy ends. Although Abby kept singing, the sound of her voice grew faint. Jonathan realized that her tree was not floating as fast as his was. She had somehow been knocked out of the main current and was either drifting aimlessly or was floating towards shore. He raised his head and looked back. Abby, he called, where are you? I'm here, back here. Her voice seemed far behind him. Her tree must not be moving. Something had stopped her. When he looked toward the sound of her voice, he saw so much floating debris in that part of the river that it was difficult in the dim moonlight to pick out which dark shape in the water was Abby. Whatever had caused Abby's tree to stop moving forward had caused other floatsum to stop there too. Jonathan debated. Should he abandon his own tree and try to swim back to Abby? But the town of Kendra was still ahead and with it the chance that someone would hear or see him. There were no towns along this part of the river. Even if he and Abby got out of the current and made it to shore, there would be no one to help them. And there was no way for Abby to walk miles to town. It's better he decided to try to get help as fast as possible rather than to stay behind with Abby. Stay with Charlotte, Jonathan shouted. No matter what happens, stay on your tree. Come back, Abby cried, an edge of hysteria in her voice. Stay with me. I can't, but I'll be back to get you. Where are you going, she called. I wish I knew, Jonathan thought. He yelled, I'm going for help. I'll be back for you as soon as I can. Keep singing. Sing to Charlotte. Jonathan, come back. Sing, Abby. Sing the Raggedy Ann song. Don't leave me. Come back. Please, Jonathan. I'm scared. You aren't the only one, Jonathan thought. I'm more scared than I've ever been in my entire life. She quit calling and began to sob. Her voice grew fainter as he moved away, and her cries soon faded away to nothing. All Jonathan could hear now was the sound of the river rushing toward the sea. Wearily, he laid his cheek against Moose and tried not to cry. Moose barked. Jonathan raised his head and looked. Moonlight glinted off the black water, making it look like liquid silver. A baby's high chair floated past. Its wooden tray tilted up as if the baby had just been lifted out. Moose barked again, wagging his tail at the high chair. It's okay, boy, Jonathan said. It's only a high chair. He wondered if Moose associated the chair with Abby. She had used one until she was almost three. Did Moose remember this? Or did Moose remember that? Shore seemed farther away than it had when he floated past Beaverville. He should have left Abby then, he thought. He should have tried to swim to shore rather than staying with her. Now they were separated anyway, and the farther he was from shore, the slimmer his chance of making it. 
Even if he did make it, he would not be near a town, so there weren't likely to be any people to help him. By the time the river passed Kendra, he might even be farther, be even farther offshore, too far offshore to be heard or seen. He wondered where his parents were. Jonathan shivered. His clothes and shoes were soaked, and the river, cold river water continually splashed over his back as he clung to the tree trunk. He pressed his cheek into the tree's rough bark and closed his eyes to hold back the tears. What were his chances of survival? If he managed to stay on the tree and ride it all the way to the Pacific Ocean, how long could he live without food or water? The sun would burn him mercilessly all day and the freezing water would chill him at night. And what about sharks? No one would be searching for him at sea. Rescuers would take one look at Ma where Magpie Island used to be and assume that Jonathan and Abby had perished there. Maybe he thought I should try to swim to shore now. Maybe I shouldn't wait until I pass Kendra. Once on shore, I could hike to town. Without Abby, I can walk as far as I have to. What if I don't make it to shore? Was it better to die trying to save himself or should he lie here hoping someone else, else might see or hear him? What about Moose? Could the dog swim that far? If Jonathan tried to make it, Moose would have tried to try. Moose would have to try too. Good dog, Jonathan said. A lump swelled his throat. Can you make it, boy? Jonathan whispered. Can you swim to shore? He reached forward and rubbed Moose's neck. Moose turned his head and whined. Jonathan recognized the noise as Moose's hunger whine. The dog did it properly at six every morning, every night, until, unless Jonathan fed him before then. I'm hungry too, Jonathan re realized. Moving slowly so as not to lose his balance, Jonathan reached over his shoulder and opened the backpack. He removed the remaining two sandwiches. He broke one in pieces and held the pieces where Moose could reach. The dog ate greedily but stayed in place. Jonathan ate the second sandwich himself and then ate a few pieces of broken cookie. Chocolate, he knew, was not good for dogs, so he didn't offer Moose any of the cookie. When he finished eating, he looked forward towards shore again. It was barely visible now. Even though the half moon was high in the sky, I'm drifting farther from land all the time, he thought. I'm going to swim for shore. I must do it now. He considered putting the leash on Moose to be sure they stayed together, but decided against it. It wouldn't be fair, he thought, to keep the dog tied to my wrist. Moose might make it to shore, even if I don't. He buckled the leash around the, his own waist so he would have it later on, later on land. He removed the backpack containing his mother's shoe and dropped the backpack into the river. Sorry, Mom. He inhaled deeply three times, filling his lungs with oxygen and holding it before he exhaled. His baseball coach had taught him to do that just before his turn to bat as a way to steady his nerves. After inhaling the fourth time, he let go of the tree and rolled sideways into the river, blowing the air out of his mouth as he dropped. As soon as his head popped up, he called, Come, boy, come, Moose. Moose was already in the water. His head and the ridge of his back were visible. His tail floated behind him as he dog paddled beside Jonathan. Jonathan swam toward shore, trying to establish a kicking rhythm that would keep him moving but not exhaust him. He al alternated between doing the crawl, which was fastest, and the breath stroke, which was slower but allowed him to see where he was going and to see what else was floating what else was floating toward him moose stayed at his side swimming as fast as jonathan but never any faster once jonathan changed from call, crawl to breath stroke just in time to see a huge tree rushing toward him jonathan drove, dove under the water coming up on the other side of the tree Moose dove too. After that, Jonathan stayed with the breath, breaststroke, changing to a dog paddle when he got tired. 
He looked frequently to the right to see if anything else was floating toward him. He glanced occasionally. He looked frequently to his right to see if anything else was floating toward him. He glanced occasionally to his left at Moose. Two more times he had to dive beneath the surface to avoid being hit by floating trees or parts of, a tr of trees. After 10 minutes of steady swimming, a huge stump swept past him. Its roots extended like outstretched hands. Jonathan grabbed one of the roots and rode along for a few seconds, resting. It occurred to him that if his strength gave out before he reached shore, he could always hang on to a different tree or another stump or something else that was floating. One way or another, he would stay alive. Determ determination gave him a fresh burst of energy. He let the stump roots slip out of his grasp and began paddling towards shore again. His legs and arms ached. He wondered if he should have taken off his shoes before he started to swim. His feet felt like blocks of cement when he kicked. He could still get his shoes off if he wanted to, but he would need shoes when he got to shore. He was not used to going barefoot, and he would doubt, and he would doubtless have a long hike ahead of him once he reached land. Land? How, how far had he come? When he looked, it did not seem any closer than when he first rolled off his tree. The swift current kept him going west. He could not tell if he was also moving north toward shore. Shoes won't do me any good if I don't make it to shore, he thought. Holding his breath, he quit kicking, reached down, and tried to untie one shoe. He sank as his cold fingers fumbled with the wet laces. When he got the shoe untied, he swam back to the surface and dog paddled while he used his other foot to pry the shoe off. Then he repeated his actions with the second shoe. Each time, he felt a shoe slip off his foot and sink into the river. His heart sank, too. He knew how much he would need those shoes later if he made it to land. If. His chest hurt from the exertion. Water splashed into his face and his father's voice echoed inside his mind. Never drink from a river, Jonathan. Even water that looks clear and clean could be polluted. Jonathan sputtered, trying to spit it out. He stroked towards shore. He was tired before he started swimming. He was exhausted now. He closed his eyes and did the dead man's float to rest. I'll float for 30 seconds, he told himself, no longer. He began to count. One, 1,000, two, 1,000. 20 seconds into his rest, something bumped his feet. Jonathan's eyes flew open as he jammed his feet down and began to tread water. A capsized tent floated past, its metal poles twisted like a pretzel. Had there been another camper on Magpie Island? After all, Jonathan wondered. Or had the had the tent come from the beach park in Beaversville or somewhere else? He forced his weary body to keep swimming. Images flashed through Jonathan's mind as he swam. Bits of his past appeared in slow motion. The way television sports replays are, replays are sometimes shown. Each segment lasted less than a second, yet he clearly experienced every detail. He saw himself as a toddler sitting on Grandpa Whitney's lap while she read him a story. He felt her warm arms around him, heard her soothing voice, and smelled a hint of talcum powder. For that brief instant, Jonathan felt secure and comforted. Next, he relived the day Abby was born and felt the excitement of going to the hospital to meet his baby sister. He saw the tears on his mother's face and heard the fear in his father's voice two years later when they told him Abby had fallen from a slide at the playground and damaged her spinal cord. Jonathan had often thought how different his life would be if Abby's baby sister had not allowed her to climb alone, if Abby's baby sitter had not allowed her to climb alone to the top of the big slide. The image, like the others, quickly faded and was replaced by his little league coach, Mr. Welch. Jonathan remembered his despair after he struck out with the bases loaded. He had wanted to quit the team right then and gave up baseball forever. Never give up, Jonathan, Mr. Welch said. You'll have your turn to shine as long as you keep trying. You must always keep trying. And two innings later, 
Jonathan smacked a triple into left field that scored the tying run. Yes, Jonathan thought as he pulled his arms through the water. Yes, I will keep trying. He had heard that when people drown, they see their whole life flash before their eyes, just before they go under for the final time. Is that why he was remembering his past? Because he was almost out of strength? He tried to kick harder, but his weary legs did not respond. Moose swam lower in the water now. His back and tail were no longer above the surface. Only his head was visible. He's tired too, Jonathan realized. He's having just as much trouble as I am. Good dog, he said. Good moose. Keep trying, boy. The shore seemed closer. Jonathan realized the river was passing a small bay where the land curved toward him for a time. A shot of adrenaline burst through him, giving him new energy. He swam harder, kicking faster. If he could get out of the main current here by the bay, he knew he would make it to shore. He switched back to the crawl. Even though he couldn't watch for floating debris that way, it was a faster stroke. He closed his eyes, concentrating on lifting each arm over his shoulder and stroking it back as hard as he could. He never saw the tree stump. It came toward him, spinning slightly, and hit him in the head. Jonathan's feet quit kicking. His arms dangled limply downward. He floated briefly, face down, before he sank.